Hello, I'm Adam from Wild Team, and I'm going to go through with you what's inside this best practice on strategy development for wildlife conservation. It starts, perhaps unsurprisingly, with an introduction. The introduction has things in it that you would expect to be in an introduction. It gives an overview of the best practice. But I will highlight uh, in this section, there's a diagram that shows the step-by-step -step approach by which you can create a conservation strategy. And it also uh, shows how this best practice on strategy development is linked to and can be used with all the other best practices in this series. For example, how it can be used uh, in conjunction with the project management best practice. This section is called principles and it's got seven key principles to follow in order to create both an effective and an ethical uh, conservation strategy. I won't go through all of them. I'll just highlight a couple of them to give you a flavor uh, of the principles. And I'll, I'll specifically mention the ones that we've added in uh, that are new from the previous version. The first one I'm gonna mention is called Fortify with Facts. And this is how you can use the best available information to create a good conservation strategy. And the second one I'm gonna highlight is called uh, Make It Last, so that you can plan in how to sustain the impact you achieve during the project after the project has ended. In order to create a really strong conservation strategy that has any chance of being successful, you really need to understand what's happening now. What's the situation you're trying to change? And that's what this section on assessing the current situation is all about. It's about building up that understanding, but also documenting it. So it takes you through step by step how to, to create um, a conceptual diagram that captures the current situation. So how to select and document the biodiversity that you want to save. You might want to save tigers, you might want to save whales, whatever. You can document it here and it shows you how to do it. It also shows you how to identify and assess the threats that are currently degrading your biodiversity target. That helps you select which one of those you're going to focus, focus on in the future. Uh, and for those threats that you've selected, you can then start using a behavior change approach in your thinking by specifically identifying and documenting the behaviors that are driving those threats. And further to that, what are the influences like attitudes or knowledge or opportunities or infrastructure uh, that are driving those behaviors? And then you build up a really complete picture of the situation uh, that you want to change and you capture it in this really cool looking diagram. Now that you've built up a thorough understanding and documented that understanding of the current situation, you can now go on to plan what impact you want to achieve. And when I'm talking about impact, I'm talking specifically about the change you make, not the things you do, the change you make. For example, the change to the biodiversity target. Do you want the target population to go up or down or or what? Uh, do, you, do you want the threats to be reduced or stabilized? Um, this, this is where you make those decisions and document what essentially what you want the future to be for that situation. Likewise, you'd um, identify what behaviors you wanted to, to change in the future. Maybe you want to reduce some of the problematic behaviors, perhaps like poaching, and where you might introduce new behaviors that would also help uh, reduce uh, threats. Say, say you had a threat for uh, plastic pollution, you might introduce behaviors about recycling uh, of, of plastic materials. And so this section uh, shows you how to capture that uh, plan change, again, in one of these kind of funky looking diagrams. It is only once you've mapped out the impact you want to achieve, that you can go into this step, planning the work, where you decide upon what activities you're going to do to achieve the impact you planned out. So it all starts off with selecting an intervention point. Where on your diagram of plan change you are going to intervene? When you've selected those intervention points, you then go on to identify what kind of work you're going to do to achieve the change that you want. And in this, you may come across a situation where you've got different options for activities you could do. 
and they all have equal merit in terms of their likely efficacy based on the evidence base that you have. So how do you decide between this kind of activity or that kind of activity? This section provides guidance on how you can assess uh, and rate the activities that you plan to do to help you make decisions about which one to select. At the end of this section, and in, indeed throughout the creation of all of these diagrams, um, a key step is to assign confidence to the linkage between the elements on your diagram. Because that will tell you the different parts of the diagram that you should start on for your project and, and the different and the parts of the diagram where you should perhaps pause and gather some more information for proceeding. Uh, because if you're confident in the chain of events between your work and the benefit to the biodiversity targets, then great, you feel confident you can go ahead with that work. If the link between your work and the biodiversity target is more tenuous, you might pause before thinking about spending time and money carrying out those activities. So that's a key final step in, in all of this is to uh, assign confidence to help you decide which parts of your work you want to proceed with. The adaptation section is kind of a catch-all section where the guidance covers some common scenarios you'll come across when you create a conservation uh, strategy. For example, it tells you how to link different levels of conservation strategy. Uh, you might have a conservation strategy for a project. How does that link to your program level conservation strategy? How does that link to your organisational level conservation strategy? It tells you how to do that. It also has guidance on how to incorporate uh, commonly used terms, for example, human wildlife conflict or climate change. How do you incorporate ecosystem services or human well-being? This section covers all that. I hope this brief overview of what's inside the strategy development uh, best practice uh, whets your appetite uh, and I encourage you to download it for free and, and share it with uh, anyone you think might be interested in it. But I'll finish off by just highlighting that as well as a free best practice, you can also get trained and certified in this key skill set. Uh, that might be very helpful uh, both in your own professional development, it might help you progress your career if you've already got a conservation job, it may, may also even help you get uh, a conservation job that you're after. And that's the same for all of the subjects that we cover and they all link together. So as you can see, we've got other best practices in training and project management, stakeholder engagement, monitoring and evaluation, and grant writing. And uh, I would encourage you to take the ones that are both interesting to you and uh, more importantly, which ones are most useful to you, your career and your work. Uh, if you do get excited and wanna do them all, then that leads to a qualification as a wildlife conservation professional. Uh, and there's more information about that on our website. As well as our website, where you can download all our best practices or sign up for some online training in any of those subjects. We also have an online global community of conservation professionals called Wild Hub. Uh, it's been going for about two years now. Uh, there's between two and 3,000 members and it's member led and it's also free. This is a space for you, if you're a conservationist, to post or seek out opportunities. For example, um, finding an opportunity for a new conservation job or some funding that you didn't know about. But it's also a space where you can communicate with peers from around the world, build your network and help create new conservation solutions and learn from what has worked and what has not worked in other circumstances. It's a great place, it's a friendly, safe, inclusive space, and I really encourage you to join uh, free if you haven't done so already. With that, I'll just say thank you very much for uh, listening today and uh, hope, hope to see you in Wild Hub, Hub sometime.